the Enchanted Princess. Once upon a time, there was an old farmer who had two sons, Austin and Carter. Carter, where are you? I need your help. Don't bother me, old man. I'm taking a nap. <sighs> Austin, keep working on that fence while I go to town. Yes, father. While the man was going to town, he thought, I have to do something before we go broke. I've got to sit down and figure this out. He sat down beneath the tree. Two people were sitting beside him, and he heard their conversation. The king's daughter is locked up in a castle, guarded by a dragon and an old lady. The man who wishes to rescue the princess has to overcome three tests. People say they are very hard tests, don't they? And those that don't pass the tests are eaten by the dragon. And if someone happens to pass those three tests, that man will marry the princess and own the castle and its treasure. Then the farmer thought, Oh, Carter will do it. He will pass those three tests and then marry the princess, and he will be king. A few days later, the farmer gave his only horse and his only sword to Carter to go and rescue the princess. Carter carelessly hit things with his sword along the way. The boy had a cruel heart. When he passed by an ant nest, he destroyed it. When he drank water from a lake, he threw rocks at the little ducks there. And as he neared the castle, he saw a beehive and hit it with his sword. He ran off and finally got to the castle. He kicked on the door and started shouting. Oh, hey, you... <sighs> Open this door immediately! <sighs> so tired. How dare you! Don't make me wait or I'll break it down! Finally, an old lady with a sweet voice opened the door. Who's knocking? I've been here almost an hour! Are you deaf? Oh no, I'm not deaf. I have to rescue the princess. I, I have to be king. Wait, wait. First, you will need to go through three tests. Tests? What, what are the tests? I'm not afraid of anything. I will throw these sunflower seeds into the air. They will be blown by the wind, and you will have to pick them up and put them inside this bag in only one hour. You think I'm crazy? What kind of test is this? I will be back in an hour. <laughs> and the old lady threw the seeds into the air and then closed the door. Ah, oh, this is impossible. I won't pick up all these seeds. When the old lady returned, she told him of the second test. She threw 12 golden rings into a deep lake. You have to pick them up in an hour. I'm not crazy. The water is deep and cold. <laughs> you are not doing it very well, my dear. But let's do the third test. Follow me. <sighs> I'm getting bored. Inside, they arrived to the castle. They went to a dark room. There are three silhouettes covered with white sheets. You have one hour to tell me which one is the princess. If your guess is right, she will be free. But if not... I choose the one on the right. The one on the right. Uncover yourself. No, oh, no, no! A dragon! No, no! Help! Help! No. <laughs> A few days later, the farmer was talking to Austin. Where's Carter? I feel worried for him. Father, let me go to the castle. No, son. I don't want to lose my only son now. Trust me, father. I will be back. But I don't have a horse. And I don't have a sword to give you. Austin only took a piece of bread 
and went on foot to the enchanted castle. He decided to rest under a tree. There he saw an ant nest, and many ants were trying to rebuild it. Oh, you poor ants! Who destroyed your nest? I will help you to rebuild. When he finished, he walked to a lake to drink some water. There he saw some little ducks swimming. Oh, you poor fuzzy ducks! You must be hungry. Here, take my only piece of bread. The little ducks ate the bread. Then he saw a beehive on the ground. He picked it up and put it up in the tree, and he continued his journey to the enchanted castle. When he arrived, he knocked at the door. What do you want, my dear? Hello. I would like to rescue the princess. You can try. The old lady spread on the ground sunflower seeds and left. Hmm. Strange lack of direction, but I think I'll clean these up. Forty-five minutes later, Austin was about to give up. Then the ants came to help him. They were grateful because he helped them rebuild their ant nest. Wow! Came marching one by one. Thank you, my good friends. The bag is full of seeds again. Then the old lady came back. Well, that's surprising. A full bag of seeds. Well, now you have to go through the second test. Here, you have to catch these twelve rings. The old lady threw the rings into the water. Austin dove into the water, but it was too deep, and he couldn't catch any of the rings before they sunk to the bottom of the lake. But then he saw something moving inside the water. They were the ducks, who came to help him because he shared with them a little piece of bread. Oh, thank you, my good friends! Now I have all twelve rings. He went straight to see the old lady. Huh? All twelve rings? That's never happened before. No matter. Follow me. The old lady explained to Austin about the third test. When he was looking at three silhouettes, he couldn't figure out which one was the princess. Hmm. They all look the same. Think, Austin. Think. Which one is the princess? Suddenly, hundreds of bees entered through the window and flew around the middle silhouette. It's the middle one. Oh, the one in the middle. Uncover it yourself. The white sheet fell to the ground, and the princess appeared. Thank you, Austin, for solving the riddles and rescuing me. The princess inexplicably said. Then they saw the dragon escaping from the tower. Now you are the master of this castle. I'll leave now. So when Austin had dried off, he asked the princess to marry him, and shockingly, she said yes. And they all lived happily ever after, building beehives and filling the castle's moat with adorable fluffy ducklings. The end. The princess and the pea. There was once a prince who wanted to get married. Being a prince, of course he had to marry a princess. But he had been brought up by his mother, the queen, to be very particular. She must be a real princess, he insisted. Nothing less would do. There were no princesses in his own kingdom, so he traveled all over the world searching for one. But every princess who was introduced to him seemed to have some fault. Either her feet were too big, or her nose was too long, or her voice was too squeaky. He just couldn't find a real princess anywhere. So he returned to his kingdom very disappointed and thinking he would have to give up the idea of marrying altogether. One night, soon after he got back, the rain began to fall in torrents, and lightning and thunder shook the sky. Everyone was crouched around their fires, listening to the wind. When a knock was heard at the palace gate, the old king put on his boots and went to open it. There, standing in the rain, was a princess. But what a sight she looked! Her golden hair stuck to her graceful neck, and the rain was running out of her silk shoes. 
yet she said she was a real princess she said she was on her way home to her own country from a visit to a neighboring kingdom when she was caught by the rain we'll soon see about that thought the queen when the princess was brought inside and introduced to everyone that's the most unlikely story i have ever heard no real princess could ever look so bedraggled guarding against being washed the cunning old queen thereupon took a dried pea from a kitchen jar went cautiously up to the guest room and put it in the center of the princess bed next she smuggled 20 mattresses out of the linen closet and laid them one after another on top of the pea you never saw such an assortment of mattresses they were all of the finest quality of course in this as in all else only the best would have found a place in the fussy queen's household so out came a mattress of goose feathers stitched into quilted pale pink satin another of lustrous purple silk and folding the fleeciest lamb's wool a third of the purest white muslin encasing a billow of swan's down there were strip mattresses sprig mattresses brocade linen and lawn mattresses and yet to come were mattresses of the supplest cloth of gold interwoven with the royal initials and the royal coat of arms finally the queen topped off all these accumulated layers with 20 feather quilts there she murmured at last huffing and puffing a bit by now after so much unwanted effort now we will see whether she is a real princess or not in the morning the princess came down to breakfast looking very tired my dear did you sleep well asked the old queen no i didn't replied the princess i don't know what was in the bed something as hard as a rock and as big as a cannon ball in fact i think it was a cannon ball i'm bruised black and blue all over then everyone smiled with delight for now they knew that she was a real princess no one else could have such delicate skin the prince immediately took her for his wife as for the pea it was taken out of the bed and put in the royal museum where it probably remains to this day the princess and the frog long long ago there was a big kingdom a brave and honest king ruled there he had a beautiful daughter the princess was very fond of playing with the ball so the king gifted her a ball made of gold on her birthday she loved that ball so much that she always kept the ball with her even when she went out of the palace one summer in the evening The princess was out for a stroll in a park. She held in her hand the golden ball. She was tossing the ball up in the air as high as she could and waited for it to fall on the ground. But she threw the ball so high that the princess didn't see where the ball had gone. She just heard a heavy splash coming from a nearby lake. Oh no! I can't believe I lost my golden ball," wept the princess in despair. <laughs> "How am I going to tell my father that I lost the precious gift he gave me?" Saying this, princess started crying. <laughs> "I would give anything to be able to get it back." Suddenly, a frog jumped out and sat over a leaf in the lake. Oh, what makes you cry, dear princess? The princess overheard the voice. She looked up, but did not see anyone around. May I be of any help to you, princess? She heard the same croaking voice again. Then, she saw a frog sitting over a leaf at the edge of the lake. 
My princess, would you like me to come help you get the ball out of the lake? The frog asked her kindly. Yes, yes, that would be lovely, clapped the princess happily. I will give you as many gems and diamonds, as many as you ask for. But the frog shook his head. Uh Uh-uh. I don't want your gems or diamonds. I don't want any of your treasure. It's of no use to me. What I ask of you is love me and let me live with you and eat from your plate and sleep in your bed with you. If you can agree, I can perhaps bring back your golden ball. What a terrible idea! How can a frog live like a human being? thought the princess. I doubt the nasty frog will ever be able to find my ball. And even if he did, he wouldn't be able to come to visit me to my castle. It is too far for him. So she replied, Yes, yes, sure, it is a promise. Whatever you say, I agree to it. Just bring me my ball and I will grant your wishes. The princess begged. The frog then dived into the lake with a splash. The princess waited eagerly with her eyes glued to the lake. Soon, the frog's head popped out. Here you are, my princess, your ball, he said. And coming out of the lake, he rolled the golden ball towards her. She took her favorite plaything and ran towards the castle, overjoyed. She forgot what she had promised the frog and left him shouting and calling after her. Wait, princess, wait. Have you forgotten your promise? Please take me with you. But she never turned back. The next day, the princess was sitting with her family at the dinner table when someone knocked gently on the door. The princess ran to the door and was surprised to see that it was the frog from the lake who had somehow succeeded to reach the castle on his own. The princess shut the door immediately and sat back on his table. Who was it that upset you so much, my darling? Her father asked. Oh, father, said the princess, not knowing how to explain what happened at the lake. Yesterday, I was playing with the gold ball that you gifted me on my birthday. I dropped it in the lake. There was a frog sitting on a leaf, and the frog offered to help me get it out of the lake from the bottom. In return, I had to promise that he could live with me here. The king thought for a while, and then he said, You are a princess, and a princess should never give empty promises. Stick to your words and let him in. The princess went to open the door, and the frog jumped and said in his croaking sound, Please take me to the dinner table so that I can eat. The princess looked at her father and reluctantly picked up the frog and brought him to the table and placed him on the table. She wiped her hand in disgust. The frog started to eat from her gold plate and started making nasty tapping and splashing sound. After dinner, the frog spoke again. I am so tired now. Take me to your bedroom and put me in your bed. I want to rest for some time. The princess cursed herself. How long can I live like this? Will I ever get rid of this dirty thing? The princess took him to her chamber and left him on a pillow next to hers. The frog slept next to the princess as she had promised, and in the morning he hopped down and went out of the castle. Phew! sighed the princess when she woke up and saw that the frog was gone. He won't bother me again now that I have granted him his wish. But she was wrong, because the frog came back in the evening. She was already in bed when she heard the same gentle knock on the door. The next morning, the princess woke up and saw that the frog was gone again. But the evening came, and frog knocked on the door for the third time. Princess felt disgusted by sleeping with Frog every day, and she started to think of a way to get rid of him. With plans running through her mind, she fell asleep. When she woke up in the morning, the Frog was gone, 
and a handsome prince was looking at her with his beautiful brown eyes. She was pleasantly shocked, but she couldn't understand what had happened overnight. The prince told her the story of the curse that had been put on him. He further said, I was a prince and lived in the castle just like you. But then, one day, a spiteful witch put a spell on me. I had to find the princess who would let me live with her for three days to break this spell. I am so happy that you were the princess who got me out of my misery. The princess was so happy to have this wonderful, handsome prince in his life. They both soon got married and lived happily in the prince's father castle. The End Thumbelina. There once was a woman who wanted so very much to have a tiny little child, but she did not know where to find one. So she went to an old good witch, and she said, I have set my heart upon having a tiny little child. Please, could you tell me where I can find one? That's easily done. Here's a grain of barley for you. Put it in a flower pot, and you'll see what you shall see. Oh, thank you. She planted the barley seed as soon as she got home. It quickly grew into a fine, large flower, which looked very much like a tulip, but the petals were folded tight, as though it was still a bud. This is such a pretty flower. The woman kissed its lovely red and yellow petals, and just as she kissed it, the flower gave a loud pop and flew open. In the middle of it sat a tiny girl. She was sweet and fair to see, but she was no taller than a human thumb. Such a pretty child. From now on, I will call you Thumbelina. A nicely polished walnut shell served as her cradle. That was how she slept at night. In the daytime, she played on a table where the woman put a plate surrounded with a wreath of flowers, on which there floated a large tulip petal. Thumbelina used the petal as a boat, and with a pair of white horsehairs for oars, she could row clear across the plate. She could sing, too. Her voice was the softest and sweetest that anyone ever has heard. One night, as she lay in her cradle, a horrible toad hopped in through the window right down on the table where Thumbelina was asleep under the red rose puddle. Here's a perfect wife for my son. She seized upon the walnut shell in which Thumbelina lay asleep and hopped off with it, the window and into the garden. The toad lived with her son. He was just like his mother, but slimy and more horrible. Don't speak so loud or you'll wake her up. She might get away from us yet. We must put her on one of the broad water lilies out in the stream. She is so small and light that it will be just like an island to her. Many water lilies with broad green leaves grew in the stream. The leaf which lay furthest from the bank was the largest of them all. And it was to this leaf that the old toad swam with the walnut shell which held Thumbelina. The poor little Thumbelina woke up early the next morning and when she saw where she was, she began to cry bitterly. There was water all around the big green leaf, and there was no way at all for her to reach the shore. Thumbelina sat down and cried. The little fishes who swam in the water beneath her up popped their heads to have a look at the little girl. No sooner had they seen her than they felt very sorry. They gathered around the green stem, which held the leaf where she was, and nodded in two with their teeth. Away went the leaf down the stream, and away went Thumbelina, far away from where the toad could not catch her. Near the edge of the woods, where she now had arrived, was a large grain field. But the grain had been harvested long ago. Only the dry, bare stubble stuck out of the frozen ground. It was just as if she were lost in a vast forest. Then she came to the door of a field mouse who had a little whole stubble. There this mouse lived, 
warm and cozy, with a whole storeroom of grain. Poor Thumbelina stood at the door just like a beggar and pled for a little bit of barley because she was hungry like anything. Oh, you poor little thing. You must come into my warm room and share my dinner. But you must keep my room tidy and tell me stories, for I am very fond of them. Thumbelina did as the kind old field mouse asked, and she had a very good time of it. Few days passed, and one day the field mouse came to Thumbelina. Soon we shall have a visitor. Once every week my neighbor comes to see me, and he's even better off than I am. If you could only get him for a husband, you would be well taken care of. But he can't see anything. You must tell him the very best stories you know. Thumbelina did not like this suggestion. She would not even consider the neighbor because he was a mole. He paid them a visit. The field mouse talked about how wealthy and wise he was and how his home was more than 20 times larger than hers. As Thumbelina had to sing for him, the mole fell in love with her sweet voice. But he didn't say anything about it yet. He had just dug a long tunnel through the ground from his house to theirs, and the field mouse and Thumbelina were invited to use it whenever they pleased, though he warned them not to be alarmed by the dead bird which lay in this passage. It was a complete bird with feather and beak. It must have died quite recently when winter set in, and it was buried right in the middle of the tunnel. The mole took a torch of decayed wood. In the darkness, it glimmered like fire. He went ahead of them to light the way through the long, dark passage. When they came to where the dead bird lay, the mole put his broad nose to the ceiling and made a large hole through which daylight could fall. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow, with his lovely wings folded at his side and his head tucked under his feathers. Thumbelina felt so sorry for him, but the mole gave the body a kick with his short stumps and said, Thank goodness none of my children can be a bird. What good is all his chirp chirping when he starves and freezes to death? Thumbelina kept silent. But when the others turned their back on the bird, she bent over, smoothed aside the feathers that hid the bird's head, and kissed his closed eyes. Maybe it was he who sang so sweetly to me in the summertime. What pleasure he gave me, the dear pretty bird. That night, Thumbelina could not sleep a wink, so she got up and wove a fine large coverlet set of a bedsheet out of hay, grass that has been dried. She took it to the dead bird and spread it over him so that he would lie warm in the cold earth. Goodbye, you pretty little bird, and thank you for your sweet songs last summer when the trees were all green and the sun shone so warmly upon us. She laid her head on his breast and it started her to feel a soft thump as if something were beating inside. This was the bird's heart. He was not dead. He was only numb with cold. And now that he had been warmed, he came to life again. Thank you, pretty child. I have been wonderfully warmed. Come on, my dears. You could sit on my back as we can fly away through the green woods. Now that the cold winter is coming, I shall fly far, far away to my home. Won't you come along with me? You can ride on my back. Yes, I will go with you. She sat on his back. Then the swallow soared into the air, over forests and over lakes. At length, they reached Swallow's home. There, the sun shone far more brightly than it ever does and the sky seemed twice as high. This is my home. If you will choose one of those glorious flowers and bloom down below, I shall place you in it, and you will have all that your heart desires. That will be lovely. 
down below was a beautiful garden with lovely white flowers. The swallow flew down with Thumbelina and put her on one of the large petals. How surprised she was to find in the center of the flower a little man. On his shoulders were the brightest shining wings. He was the fairy of the flower. But when he saw Thumbelina, he rejoiced, for she was the prettiest little girl he had ever laid eyes on. So he took off his golden crown and put it on her head. He asked if he might know her name, and he asked her to be his wife. Yes, I will. Only if you bring my mother here, and we three will live happily here. He agreed and brought Thumbelina a present, a pair of wings. Everyone rejoiced. Soon, Thumbelina Mother joins them. Oh, Thumbelina, you don't know how happy I am to get you back. And they all lived happily ever after. The End The Dragon Slayer Once upon a time, long, long ago, in a land far, far away, a village small, small, so very small, had finished their harvest and began to celebrate a celebratory celebration. There was music and there was dancing. A boy named Albert was the strongest and most handsome in the village, and the girls stood in line to dance with him. But late in the evening, a new girl caught his eye. What's your name? I am Lucy. You're not from around here, are you? No. Where are you from? From somewhere else. One of them clearly wasn't too bright, but they danced every dance without resting for the rest of the night, and they fell in love. So maybe it was both of them. But suddenly, there was a loud thundering of horses' hooves outside. I, I must leave. No, stay. The music is still playing. Let's dance. Suddenly, all the doors in the room were kicked open at once, and the king's soldiers rushed toward Albert and Lucy with swords and spears. Then, everyone in the room bowed down. What's going on? Take your hands off of my daughter. The soldiers pulled Albert away from Lucy and threw him to the floor. Then they pointed their swords and spears at his face. Father, please don't hurt him! Albert was confused. King George is your father? King George didn't let Lucy answer. He pointed his finger at Albert's nose and shouted, You stay away from my daughter. But I want to marry her. Do you think I would let a farmer marry my daughter? Why not? I love her and she loves me. Silly boy. A princess can't marry a common village boy. A princess may only marry a nobleman, or a knight, or a really rich man. Then King George grabbed Lucy by the arm and pulled her toward the door. Your Majesty, if I become rich, may I have your daughter's hand in marriage? King George stopped and turned. He stroked his chin and smiled and said, I tell you what, there are heaps of gold and jewels in the treasury at the old castle. If you go there and return the crown jewels to me, you may keep the rest of the gold and jewels, and you may marry my daughter. That's what I'll do then. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Then King George and the princess left and rode away. The room was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. All eyes turned toward Albert. Why is everyone looking at me? Do you realize what you just said? What? Do you know why King George abandoned the old palace? Why? Because a dragon built his nest there. A dragon? <clears throat> Why would King George send me after the royal treasure if he knew a dragon was living there? <laughs> because he doesn't want you to marry his daughter. He wants the dragon to breathe fire upon you. Albert walked toward the door. No, I don't care. I love Lucy, and I'm going to do everything I can to marry her, even if it kills me. 
Maybe Albert was the one who wasn't too bright, but he sure was determined. The next day, Albert started toward the old palace. Then he found out that just getting there was not going to be easy. It was a hundred miles away, with dangerous icy rivers along the way. I must go on, even if I didn't bring winter clothes. By the time he crawled the snow-covered rivers, he was freezing to death. Yep, Albert's not too bright. As he began crossing the other side of the river, he fell, and his body rolled and rolled and rolled down the riverside. He was knocked out by the fall. He didn't wake up until he rolled into an ice-cold river. When Albert was sure he would drown or freeze to death, the icy river emptied into an even faster moving river. Oh no, I lost the sword I brought to slay the dragon. Now I'll be defenseless against the dragon. After a few minutes, he was able to swim and stay afloat. He swam to the other side of the river and hauled himself up onto shore water. <sighs> now, I can see the, 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 the high stone walls of the castle. He also saw patches of the green grass that had been blackened by the fiery breath of the dragon. Suddenly, Albert heard the loud thumping and swishing of the dragon's huge wings. I must find cover in a hollow log. The hollow log caught fire, but Albert was unharmed. At least he was getting warm again. <laughs> I'll have to wait here until the sounds of the dragon's wings fade away. Then he crawled out of the hollow log and watched it burn as he thought and thought of a way to get by the dragon and get to the treasure without being burnt to a crisp. I must find out where the dragon's nest is. Wait, what is that over there? It's the treasury where King George's treasure is stored. Next. Albert borrowed a scarecrow from a nearby cornfield. In the darkest part of the night, he sneaked the scarecrow inside the palace and up to the top of the wall, opposite the treasury, in plain sight of the dragon. What's this? A barrel. I will cut the top off the barrel and sneak it up as close to the dragon as possible. Then he climbed into the barrel and fell asleep. The next morning, he was awakened by the loud thumping. As expected, when the dragon awoke, he thought the scarecrow on the palace wall was a man. He flew toward the scarecrow. <laughs> now that the dragon is not watching me, I will quickly climb out of the barrel and carry it to the treasury. He carried the barrel inside the treasury just as the scarecrow was burning to a cinder. Then. He stepped out of the treasury and shouted, Hey, dragon! Over here! Come and get me! Hearing that, the dragon turned and flew at top speed toward the treasury as Albert dove out of sight. When the dragon landed and poked his head through the treasury doors, Albert covered the dragon's head with the barrel. When the dragon breathed fire, the barrel directed the fire at the dragon himself and the dragon burned himself to a crisp. <laughs> I can't believe that worked. I will return home and ask King George if I can marry Princess Lucy. He reached the King George's courtroom and signaled his servants to bring in a wooden treasure box. Albert showed the crown jewels to the king. I slew the dragon, and now I'm a very rich man. At that moment, Princess Lucy entered the room and hugged Albert. Thank you for what you did for me. So even though he wasn't too bright, Albert got to marry the girl he loved, and he got a load of treasure and the old castle too. And they all lived happily ever after. The End If you enjoyed this story, Please like and subscribe our channel and press the bell icon to get future updates. And don't forget to comment! An old woman used to live in a village. She had a very beautiful daughter. 
Her daughter liked cherries so much that she did not used to eat anything else. Lunch or dinner, she only wanted to eat cherries. In fact, people also started calling her Cherry now. There was a clever woman living in Cherry's neighborhood. Not just clever, she was very expert in black magic too. And in her garden, there were so many trees of cherry. Cherry used to sneak in the garden because she could not resist and used to take some cherries. Because of this, witch was very angry. And on the top, Cherry was very beautiful too. Her hair were very long and silky. Her face was bright as sun. Her features were so beautiful that witch could hardly hold her anger. One day, as usual, Cherry was collecting cherries in the garden. Witch saw her and could not hold her anger and casted magic spell on her which turned her into an ugly frog. Poor Cherry! King of that village had three sons. King was very old and weak. King said to his sons, I will give you all a task. Whosoever will finish the task will be the next king. First task, I want a velvet cloth so soft that it can easily pass my ring. And soon all three of them went out to find such velvet as soon as possible. Elder two brothers bought so many velvets from market. But the youngest one was walking and thinking how a normal velvet from the market can pass through dad's ring. He walked very far, looked in so many places but could not find anything. He was so tired so he decided to rest on the bank of the river. Suddenly a frog jumped from the river and asked him, Tell me, what happened? Why are you so tensed? She had such a sweet voice. Hearing that, man said, How can you help me? But at least tell me, why are you worried? Prince told her the story and after listening to that, she jumped back in the river. She came back with a small piece of cloth and said, Take this cloth. This will help you. Something is better than nothing, the prince thought and left for the palace. As soon as he was getting close to the palace, the cloth was getting heavier. King was happy that all three of them had come with velvet cloth. He gave them the ring. When elder sons tried, only a part of velvet cloth could pass through it and they failed. Then the youngest son gave the cloth. Everyone was surprised to see such clean and beautiful velvet. The velvet could pass through King's ring very easily. I have finished one task. Prince was very relaxed. King gave them new task that he wants a dog as small as it could fit in a walnut shell. Again, all three of them started their hunt. This task was much tougher. Where can you find such a dog? Youngest prince was walking towards the jungle. He walked for so long and once he was tired, he sat near the same river bank to get some rest. Suddenly he thought of the frog that had helped him last time. Right then, she jumped out of the river. Oh my prince, why are you worried again? Prince told her whole story. Wait, let me try and help you again. And then she jumped in the river again. She came out of the river with a dried fruit in her hand. Take this and break it once you reach the palace. You will see the magic. Prince happily left for the palace. Elder brothers found a lot of puppies but they were of no use. They tried to finish the task. But some of them had big head and some of them had big feet and some of them had long tail. Both of them were sad of failure. Now the youngest one broke the dry fruit and surprise! There was a sweet little puppy sitting inside the shell. The king tried fitting this puppy in walnut shell and he could easily fit inside. 
prince was very happy the king was happy too now it was time for the third and the last task whoever will marry the most beautiful girl will be the next king great this was an easy task elder son went out to search for the beautiful bride they knew so many beautiful girls they were happy for this task but youngest prince was sad now who will help me that little frog too can't help me she can't jump in the river and find a beautiful bride he was lost in his thought and again he ended on the river bank the frog again greeted him what happened to you again now why are you worried it seems you have cried a lot can you please tell me what happened and then the prince told her everything frog said don't worry and head towards the palace as soon as you will be close to the palace look behind but don't laugh please prince was not able to trust the frog this time he was very tense and sad then he started to head towards the palace as soon as the palace was close to him he heard some words from behind he saw behind and he was totally stunned six very big rats were pulling a cart made of pumpkin and one very big frog was riding the cart inside on a beautiful chair there was his friend from the river this was very weird scene but prince didn't laugh at all he was not able to understand anything what kind of cart is this what is happening here i can't understand anything a cart made of pumpkin and after a short while he saw totally different cart it was being pulled by two black horses person riding the cart was dressed like a soldier inside a very beautiful girl was sitting the prince recognized her in very first sight that she is the frog from the river all three of them entered the palace both elder ones had a big fleet of beautiful girls but as soon as cherry stepped inside the palace everyone was mesmerized of her and she was crowned as the queen of beauty because she was the most beautiful of all so my little friends since the youngest prince finished all the tasks so he was announced as the next king snow white and the seven dwarfs once upon a time a queen sat sewing by her window The snow was falling outside and she watched the flakes settle on her black ebony window sill. As she sewed, she pricked her finger with the needle and a drop of red blood fell onto the snow. She thought to herself, "I wish I had a daughter with skin as white as the snow, with lips as red as this blood, and with hair as black as this ebony." By and by, her wish came true and she gave birth to a baby girl. whom she called snow white but the queen died when her baby was born and not long afterwards the king married again the new queen was very beautiful but she was an evil woman and could not bear the idea that anyone might be lovelier than she a magic mirror hung in her room and each day she would look in it and ask mirror mirror on the wall who is the fairest of us all and the mirror would reply you o queen are fairer than all the years went by and each day snow white grew more beautiful until one morning when the queen looked yet again into her mirror and asked mirror mirror on the wall who is the fairest of us all you are fair o queen is true but snow white is fairer far than you The queen was beside herself with hatred and jealousy and resolved to get rid of her stepdaughter at once. She sent for a huntsman and ordered him to take the girl deep into the forest and kill her and bring back her heart as proof that she was dead. The huntsman rode with Snow White into the deepest part of the forest but when he took out his knife to kill her He was so touched by the girl's beauty and gentleness that he could not plunge its blade through her heart. I cannot kill you myself, but I cannot take you back to the palace, and I fear the wild beasts of the forest 
will soon eat you up. He left Snow White in the forest and on his way back he killed a deer instead and gave its heart to the queen who believed that it was Snow White's. Poor Snow White, meanwhile, was wandering in the dark forest terrified. The wild beasts watched her as she stumbled through the trees but they did not touch her. At nightfall, she came to a clearing in the wood where there was a little house. She tapped on the shutters but no one answered. She tapped on the door and then opened it and went inside. She found herself in a low room with a wooden table and benches stretching the length of it. On the table were seven bowls, seven spoons and seven cups. For this was the home of the seven dwarves who worked in the mountains digging for gold. Snow White was so hungry that she sat down and ate a little of the pudding in each bowl and sipped some milk from each cup. Then she went upstairs where there was a room just large enough to hold seven small beds. She slipped into one of them and was soon fast asleep. As the moon came up in the sky, the seven dwarfs returned. Each carried his shovel and pickaxe on his back and his bag of gold tied to his waist with a leather strap. As soon as they set their lanterns on the table, they saw someone had been in their house. Who has been eating our food? Yes, yes, who has been eating our food? They cried. Then they climbed upstairs to the bedroom and found Snow White fast asleep on a bed. And tell me, who is this beautiful child? I wonder, who is it? They asked each other in delight and amazement. Then Snow White awoke and told them her story and the dwarfs felt so sorry for her that they invited her to stay with them and be their housekeeper. They warned her that she must never open the door to anyone while they were away digging in the mountains for they feared that the wicked queen would find out she was alive and try to kill her. So Snow White stayed with the dwarves and made their beds and swept their rooms and cooked supper for them. She was very happy with the dwarves and before long she had forgotten all about her wicked stepmother. But one day However, the queen again asked her magic mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? You are fair, O queen, it's true. But Snow White is fairer far than you. Deep within the forest glade, she her home with dwarfs has made. The queen's face turned black with rage at these words. Realizing the huntsman had tricked her, she resolved to kill Snow White with her own hands. She disguised herself as a peddler woman and made her way to the dwarf's house in the forest. Snow White was sitting by the window, patching a jacket belonging to one of the dwarfs. The queen called out to her in a rough country woman's voice, Buy my buttons, ribbons and lace. Each one will suit your face. Delighted at the chance of buying something pretty, Snow White quite forgot the dwarf's warning. She ran to open the door. The laces on your bodice are loose, my dear, said the disguised queen. Let me tie them up for you. And with that, she laced Snow White up so swiftly and so tightly that the girl could not breathe and fell to the ground as if she were dead. Laughing, the wicked queen hurried back to her palace, feeling certain she had got rid of Snow White for good. When the dwarfs came home that night, they found Snow White lying in the doorway. As soon as they lifted her up, they could see what had happened. They cut the laces on her bodice with a knife and at once the air rushed back into Snow White's lungs and she began breathing again. She told them what had happened and the dwarfs realized that the peddler woman was the wicked queen in disguise still determined to kill her. Never open the door to anyone again. They begged her and Snow White promised she would not. 
That night the queen went to her mirror again. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? You are fair, O queen, it's true, but Snow White is fairer far than you. At this, the enraged queen rushed to her cellar in the castle where she kept her secret potions. There she made a poisoned apple. One side was bright red and the other green. The green side could safely be eaten, but one bite of the red side would kill in a second. Yet again, the queen disguised herself. This time, she dressed as a country woman in ragged clothes with a basket of apples over her arm. On top of the pile, she placed the beautifully colored poisoned apple. She arrived at the dwarf's house just as Snow White was drawing water from the well. But as soon as the girl saw her coming, she grew frightened and ran indoors, bolting the door behind her. Then she heard the voice of the countrywoman calling, Apples! Fresh and sweet apples! And she longed to test them. If she opened the window and kept the door shut, there could be no danger. So she opened the shutter and leaned out. Let me see your apples. She called down. Taste this one, my pretty. It is one of the best, replied the queen, holding up the poisoned apple. Then, as the girl hesitated a bit, she went on. Don't be afraid to eat it. See, I'll cut it into two halves, one for you and one for me. She began to eat the green half and threw the red one up to Snow White who could not resist taking a bite. But she had no sooner put the apple into her mouth than she fell to the ground dead. That night, the queen polished and stroked the mirror as she asked, Mirror, mirror in my hand, who is the fairest in the land? Queen of beauty, you are she. None can now your rival be. When the dwarfs came home and found Snow White dead, beyond reviving, they built a glass coffin which they set among flowers nearby so they could watch over her day and night. One day, a young prince came riding by with his huntsmen. Seeing the glass coffin, he dismounted from his horse, curious for a look at the girl inside. She seemed to be in a deep sleep, for her skin was still as white as snow, her lips as red as blood, and her hair as black as ebony. Her beauty enchanted him. He begged the dwarfs, Oh, please let me carry the coffin away with me. I will give you greater riches than you can ever hope to dig out of these mountains. No, no. She is worth more to us than all the gold in the world. But at last, when they saw that the prince had fallen in love with their dear Snow White, they took pity on him and gave him the coffin as a present. The prince told his huntsmen to carry the glass case carefully to his palace. But as they were lifting it up, one of them stumbled over a root and the jarring made the piece of apple fall from between Snow White's lips. She awoke and sat up, looking about her in amazement. The prince told her everything that had happened and then asked her to become his wife. And Snow White, who had loved him the moment she set eyes on him, happily agreed. A great feast was held in honor of their marriage and one of the guests invited was the wicked queen. As she wrote herself for the banquet, she asked the mirror, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? Fairer than you was rarely seen, but Snow White too is now a queen. Your fairness then is nothing worth. Now Snow White's radiance fills the earth. When she heard this, the queen smashed the mirror in pieces to the ground 
and she was so filled with a jealous rage that her heart burst and she fell down dead. But Snow White and her prince lived happily ever after. The Sleeping Beauty Once upon a time, there was a king and a queen who were very unhappy because they had no children. They had been married a long time and had almost given up hope. At last, the dearest wish came true with the birth of a most beautiful baby girl. Their joy was so great that no cost was spared in the preparations for the splendid christening, to which the king and the queen invited all the fairies in the kingdom. All that is except one. There were 13 fairies in the domain, but actually only 12 had been invited because no one knew exactly where the 13th was to be found. Nobody liked her very much anyway. She was always inclined to be crotchety and quarrelsome and was always picking up the other fairies, probably because they were all younger and prettier than she was. After the christening ceremony, the 13th fairy appeared in a rush of rage at having been overlooked. Fearing some mischief was brewing, the youngest fairy hid herself behind the tapestry hangings so that she would be the last to announce her gifts and could undo whatever harm the old fairy was plotting. Then the fairies began to make their gifts to the little princess. The first gave her beauty, the second goodness, the third gracefulness, the fourth made her a perfect dancer, the fifth gave her a lovely singing voice, and the sixth the skill to play every musical instrument in the world perfectly. In short, they gave her everything one could wish for in life. Then came the old fairy's turn. Angrily she stepped up to the prince's cradle and cried out with jealous bite. When you're fifteen, you will prick your finger with a spindle and fall lifeless to the ground. Then she turned around and left the hall. At this terrible curse, everyone trembled and began to weep. But at that instant, the youngest fairy stepped out of her hiding place. Take heart. Your daughter shall not die. It's true that I have not the power to undo the envious fairy spell completely. The princess will indeed prick her finger with a spindle when she is fifteen. But instead of dying, she will only fall into a deep sleep that will last a hundred years. And when that time has passed, a king's son will come and waken her. The king, hoping to save his daughter from the old fairy spell, immediately ordered that every spindle and every spinning wheel in the country should be burned. All the good wishes of the first fairies came true. The princess grew into a young girl of such beauty, goodness and grace as had never been seen before. She had just become fifteen, when one afternoon, she was playing a game of hide and seek with the other boys and girls in the castle. It was her turn to hide, and she ran into the forest end of the courtyard where there were several doors that led into a cluster of towers which had been shut up for many years. At length, she reached a little room at the top and there she found an old woman sitting at a spinning wheel with the wheel whirring round and the flax twirling on the spindle. What are you doing? <laughs> I am spinning. The old woman, who obviously had not heard of the king's order that every spinning wheel in the land should be destroyed and did not know who her visitor was. Sometimes I spin flags into linen. Sometimes I spin a ship's fleece into wool. Sometimes I even spin gold into the thread for fine ladies to sew with. Oh, is it difficult? Yes, at first it is. Uh, uh, let me try, please. Yes, you can. The princess begged, and the old woman handed her the spindle and the thread. No sooner had she taken the spindle than its point pricked her hand, oh. and she immediately fell to the ground in a swoon. The curse of the wicked old fairy had come true. 
The old woman, terrified, cried out for help and people came running from all parts of the castle. They tried to bring the princess round by throwing water on her face, loosening her gown and holding smelling salts under her nose. But nothing worked. Realizing that the spell had begun and must run its course, the king ordered his daughter to be carried to her bedchamber and laid on a bedspread embroidered with gold and silver to sleep in peace until the appointed hundred years had passed. The fairy who had saved the princess's life came to know about the princess and left immediately in a chariot of fire drawn by six dragons and arrived at the king's palace in less than an hour. As she walked through the palace, she brushed every living thing in it with a wand except the king and queen. As she touched them, they fell asleep. Ministers, governesses, clerks, maids of honor, soldiers, cowherds, footmen, pages all fell asleep. Outside in the courtyard, the wind stopped blowing and in the gardens, the flowers closed their petals and prepared for the long night. Then the king and queen kissed their beloved daughter and sadly left the castle forever. Within a quarter of an hour, a forest of trees and creepers had grown up around its walls so thickly intertwined that no one could pass through them and disturb the princess as she slept. The topmost turrets of the castle could barely be seen above the mass of greenery. The fairy had done her work quickly and well. Ninety-nine summers and ninety-nine winters had passed when one fine day the son of the reigning king was hunting in the forest. He caught sight of the distant turrets and asked his men what they were. Some told him that they believed it was a ruin haunted by spirits. An old peasant stepped forward and said, May it please your highness, more than fifty years ago I heard my father say, that his grandfather had told him there was a castle in this forest in which the most beautiful princess ever born was lying asleep. She was under a spell and it is said that she could only be awakened by a king's son. The prince's heart was set on fire by these words. Impatient to discover the truth for himself, he drew his sword and advanced towards the creepers. The metal flashed in the sunlight as he struck it into the deepest knot of thorns. To his surprise, it gave way easily. He had only to touch the branches for them to fall apart and allow a passage large enough to let him and his horse through. What surprised him even more was that as soon as he had passed through the briars, they closed again behind him, cutting the followers off. Alone he advanced through the first courtyard which was filled with horses and men whom at first he thought were dead. Then he realized that they were all asleep and breathing peacefully. Finally he came to a room where the pale light filtered onto a bedecked bed on which lay a sleeping girl more ravishing than any he had ever beheld. Trembling, the prince approached the bed and fell on his knees beside it gazing at the princess. The fingers of her hand rested lightly on a puppy curled up sleeping in the crook of her arm. A faint smile played about her lips as if a sweet dream contented her as she slept. At last, the prince bent over the princess and kissed her gently on the forehead. And now, the curse was at an end. At the touch of his lips, the princess awoke. I have waited for you so long, she said, smiling at the prince. Together they walked through the castle and wherever they went, the people woke up around them. All the court woke and everyone set about their duties again. The prince and the princess went into a great hall where a delicious supper was served to them. The prince and the princess who were falling more deeply in love with every minute that passed, were married as soon as supper was over. And then, the merriment and rejoicing, the feasting and music making began all over again.
The Magic Porridge Pot Once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl named Melody. She lived with her mother in a small cottage. They were very, very poor, but Melody tried to make her mother happy by singing songs to her. Every day, Melody used to go into the woods to find something to eat. She used to bring back whatever she could find, but their bellies were never full. One day, saddened with their poverty, Melody left the house and went into the woods looking for something to eat. No matter how hard she searched, there was nothing to be found. Finally, Melody could bear it no more. She sat on a rock and started to cry. While crying, she sang a sad song in her sweet, melodious voice. Hearing her voice, a forest fairy appeared in front of her and said, What happened, my child? Why are you crying? And what are you doing alone in the woods? I am here to find something to eat for me and my mother. We are very poor and very hungry, said Melody with grief on her face. Don't worry, the fairy said. And with her magical wand, she changed a pebble into a big magical pot. Melody was amazed to see the magic. Take this pot home, and your family shall never be hungry again. I don't want to be rude, but what good is an empty pot if there's no food in it to cook? Melody said in a disheartening voice, to which the fairy answered, This is a magical pot. When you want something to eat, say, Cook, pot, cook. And when it's ready, say, Stop, pot, stop. <gasps> Melody was delighted with the gift she got from the fairy. And, with due respect, she asked the fairy, Oh, dear fairy godmother, I don't have enough words to thank you. Please, tell me what I can do for you in return. I don't want anything in return. But if you want, you can sing me a beautiful song every day. Before Melody could ask any more questions, the forest fairy disappeared. When Melody arrived home with nothing but an empty pot, her mother was very unhappy and said, What use is the pot if you have nothing to cook in it? Melody lifted the pot to the table and simply said, Cook, pot, cook! Nothing happened. Melody looked worried, but then the pot started to shake and hissed. The steam rose and up bubbled the creamiest porridge they had ever seen. Melody's mother understood that the pot was magical. She was so hungry Yummy. that she could mm. not resist the creamy mm. porridge, oh, it's and delicious. she licked it with her finger. She was overwhelmed with the taste of the porridge so much that she did not pay attention to Melody's other command. Stop, pot, stop! They ate and ate until the pot was empty and their stomachs were full. Melody's mother rubbed her stomach happily. Melody then thought, Oh, it's time for me to go and sing a song for the forest fairy. So she left the house and went into the woods again. Here at home, her mother was so happy that they would never have to worry about the food again. She collected all the old pots in which she used to cook and threw them away bye bye. to make space See for you the later. new one. Or not. She polished and patted the new pot. All this hard work made her hungry again. Cook, 
pot cook, she commanded, and presto, from inside the pot, more delicious <laughs> porridge bubbled up. Not even bothering to get the bowl, she ate directly from the pot. Mmm, delicious! But as quickly as she ate, the pot kept filling up until it was set to bubble up right over the edge. Oh dear, how did Melody make the pot stop? Enough pot, enough! But the pot bubbled on. It's plenty pot, it's plenty! The porridge steamed over the edge onto the table. Really, that will do! The porridge pours over the floor. Melody's mother starts to panic. Cease! Uh, finish! No more! She commanded. Soon, she realized that she had made a great mistake and ran away. The porridge poured out from the doors and windows onto the streets, bubbling and forming a great wave and rolled through the village. People gathered up on their rooftops and started to call for help. Melody heard the villagers calling out in distress. She raced down the woods towards the village. She took a wooden plank and a stick and rode towards her house. When she reached just outside her house, she shouted, Stop! Pot, stop! And that is just what the pot did. As the bubbling subsided, Melody saw that all the villagers were reaching down and lifting a handful of creamy porridge to their mouth. The whole village enjoyed the porridge. They ate and ate and ate the whole winter long. And no one in the village was hungry ever again. The End Cinderella Once there was a rich man whose first wife died, leaving him with a small daughter. After some years, the man married again, but his second wife was as proud as she was mean and loved no one except her own two ugly daughters. These girls in turn were jealous of the man's first child and soon made themselves the center of the household, forcing the girl to become their servant. She had to scrub the floors and wash the dishes, shake out the heavy feather beds and worst of all, get up before dawn each day to clean out the cinders in the hearth. The poor girl slept in an attic under the roof on a sack full of straw. In winter time, when the snow blew through the tiles and covered the sack like an eat down, she would lay herself down near the ashes and cinders in the kitchen hearth in order to keep warm. For this reason, and because her clothes were always dusty with the ashes from the fire, the two sisters used to call her Cinderella. In fact, they were jealous of her, for no matter how hard Cinderella worked, nor how ragged her clothes were, she still looked far prettier than they. One day, the king's son gave a ball and invited all the fashionable people to it. Cinderella's stepmother and her daughters were invited along with the rest, and the ugly sisters set to work at once, ordering elaborate gowns, petticoats, and wigs for themselves. They made Cinderella starch the lace and pleat the frills, steam the velvet, and iron the silk. I'm going to wear a red velvet gown with French trimmings, said the elder, and the younger said, a gold flowered blue bodice with my diamond stomacher, which is far from being the most ordinary one in the world. They sent for the best hairdresser they could get to make up their wigs, and the most fashionable dressmaker to sew their new robes. And they brought beauty patches 
from the smartest shop in the city to stick on their faces. While Cinderella helped them arrange their hair, they teased her about the ball. Wouldn't you like to go too? They asked. Oh, but of course you can't. Everyone there would laugh at the cinder dust on your dress. Anyone other than Cinderella would have done their hair badly and ruined it. But she was a good, kind person and made them look as beautiful as she possibly could. On the day of the ball, the ugly sisters spent hours admiring themselves in the oval mirrors in their rooms. At last, the hour of the ball drew near and they stepped into their coach and drove off to the palace in a cloud of red and blue flounces and frothy lace. Cinderella watched them until they were out of sight. Then she went back to her seat by the fire and cried her heart out from loneliness and sorrow. Suddenly, there was a tapping at the window and a strange lady entered the kitchen. She had green eyes and a long cloak and she carried a small wand in her hand. She asked Cinderella what was the matter. I wish, I wish I could. Cinderella was crying so hard that she could not finish her sentence. My dear, you wish you could go to the ball. Well, so you shall. A long time ago, when your mother was still alive, I became your fairy godmother. Now, be a good girl, my child, and run into the garden and bring me a large golden pumpkin. Cinderella hurried into the garden and with the help of a lantern chose the finest pumpkin there and brought it to her godmother. That lady took a little silver knife out of her pocket and scooped out the center of the pumpkin leaving nothing but the rind. Then she struck it with a wand and it instantly turned into a fine coach. The girl had seen carriages with the grand ladies driving through the steer when she was scrubbing the front steps and she had wistfully seen her sisters riding haughtingly off the ball in the stylish coach. But she had never seen a coach like this, all covered in gold, the color of a pumpkin. Next, the godmother asked her to look in the mouse trap in the pantry, where she found six mice, all alive. The fairy told Cinderella to lift up the little trap door, and as each mouse scuttled out, she gave it a tap with her wand and turned it into a fine horse with a long flowing mane. In no time, they were harnessed to the coach and made a handsome team of six horses with beautiful mouse-colored grey coats. We still need a coachman, she said to Cinderella, who at once had an idea. There is a rat trap in the shed, she cried. I'll go and see if there is a rat in it that we could make into a coachman. So she brought in the trap and inside it they found a stout rat with splendid whiskers whom the fairy turned into a fat, jolly coachman with the smartest moustache you ever saw. After that, she said to Cinderella, Go into the garden again, my dear, and you will find six lizards behind the watering can. Bring them to me. Cinderella had no sooner done so than the godmother turned them into six footmen in livery who skipped up behind the coach and hung into its straps as tightly as if they had done nothing else all their lives. Then the fairy turned to Cinderella and asked her if she was pleased. Oh yes, cried Cinderella. But how can I go to the ball dressed in rags like this? Her godmother touched her once with the wand and her clothes were turned into a gown of Indian muslin edged with swans down and pearls, silver and white like a summer's night. On her head lay a crown of starry flowers and on her hand she wore a ring of gold and precious stones. 
finally the fairy changed the wooden clocks on her feet into slippers of spun glass lined with swan's down as cinderella was just about to drive off in her coach and six her godmother called out remember to come back before midnight dear if you stay a moment longer the coach will be a pumpkin again the horses mice the coachman a rat the footmen lizards and your clothes as ragged as before cinderella promised to leave the ball before 12 and then away she drove trembling with joy when they saw her step out of the coach the prince and all the court was struck dumb with admiration the lords and ladies left off dancing and the violinist stopped playing the better to admire cinderella's beauty then as the prince asked her to be his partner the violinist took up their bows again and the music sounded more sweetly than ever before the king the queen and everyone present praised cinderella's beauty and her graceful dancing and wondered who she could be the prince never left her side and the two of them danced and talked until they felt they had known each other all their lives so lost were they in each other that cinderella quite lost track of the time as the clock began striking midnight she started up and fled through the palace like a deer the prince hurried after her but he could not catch her as she ran down the great staircase one of her glass slippers came off and the prince picked it up and put it in his pocket the guards at the palace gate were asked if they had not seen a princess go out they had seen nobody they said save for a young girl in rags who looked like a kitchen maid when the ugly sisters returned from the ball they told cinderella that the prince had quite lost his heart to the mysterious princess who had vanished so suddenly and that he had done nothing but gaze at her little glass slipper for the remainder of the evening the prince ordered that the slipper should be laid on a silk cushion and carried in state through the city while his heralds read a proclamation that he would marry the girl whose foot the slipper fitted it was to be tried on every unmarried lady beginning at the top with the princess and the duchess the turn came for the ugly sisters to open their door to the royal messenger the slipper was brought to the elder sister to try on but push as she might her foot was too big so greedy was she to become a princess that she actually snipped off her big toe with a pair of scissors and managed to squeeze her foot into the slipper but the royal messenger saw the blood through the glass and disqualified her then the second sister tried on the slipper but this time it was her heel that was too big so she pared it down with a kitchen knife until the shoe fitted however she limped so badly that the messenger discovered her trick and disqualified her too then cinderella laughed and said please let me try on the slipper despite her sister's protests the messenger kneeled down and slipped it on her foot it fitted her as if it had been made of wax then cinderella pulled out the other slipper from her pocket and put it on her other foot the fairy godmother appeared at the moment and changed cinderella's clothes into robes that were more magnificent than any she had worn before then her two sisters recognized her as the beautiful lady at the ball and they threw themselves at her feet and begged her pardon for the ill treatment of her cinderella kissed them and said she would forgive them gladly if they behaved to her like a sister they both promised they would from now on 
she was brought to the prince who thought her more charming than ever. And a few days later, they were married. Cinderella, who was as good as she was beautiful, found husbands for her sisters too, who were wealthy and kinder than they had any right to expect. And then, Cinderella and her prince lived happily ever after.